My name is Wayne King. I grew up here in Fond du Lac. Uh, graduated from Literature High School. <coughs> and then took a vacation for about 30. Oh, you want that recorded, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Can I start over? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My name is Wayne King, and I grew up here in Fond du Lac. Um, graduated from Goodrich High School in 1968, and then I went on a long vacation. Is there a mark on the floor here? <laughs> and I served in the military for 26 and a half years, retired, retired uh, 1998, and returned to Fond du Lac and went and got a teaching degree. I have, so I have a history degree uh, and a degree in social sciences uh, in the School of Education. I never got a real teaching job, I just did a lot of substituting, which was quite, quite rewarding. Uh, and I put a lot of time into just researching military history. I, I really enjoy that. Been to a lot of places to where a lot of things have happened. I, li I lived in Greece for five years, and what a great place to research military history. All those great battles from hundreds of thousands of years ago. All right. Uh, tonight, today's pre presentation is called A Prelude to War. It's how the United States got to World War I. We're not going to talk about World War I, but we're going to talk about how we got there and how our dealings with Mexico got us there. And you're going to get a little history about, about Mexico and what, what was going on with, with them. Um, so. Here's a, we're going to talk about five different areas. Mexican independence, the U.S. border problems, and I, I'm talking a hundred years ago, not today. But you're going to see a lot of similar similarities, believe me. Uh, Company E, which is from Fond du Lac, the home front, right here, and America and the European War. Some of the things that actually pushed us into the war. Early Mexican American history. When I say that, I'm not talking about Mexican American history here in the United States. I'm talking about our dealings with Mexico from 1820 to 1916, 1917 time frame. Mexico gained its independence in 1921 from Spain, and for 10 years, about 11 years before that, it was a vice royalty, semi-independent of Spain, but still belonging to Spain. And that didn't work out, and there was a large revolution, and the Mexican military and the peasants and everybody else involved overthrew the vice royalty and they became a democracy. They based their constitution basically on, on the U.S. constitution and their government, of course a democracy, everybody had a right to vote. The church, the Catholic church, was pretty much uh, put, put in the back seat, lost a lot of its lands, its missions, uh, societies like the Jesuits were banned, were sent home, uh, and they were told to keep out of politics. <laughs> the people, mostly poor, mostly poor, very few rich people in Mexico back then, and those that were or did have money, the merchants and large landowners. But most were uh, mixed descent of Spanish and Mexican descent or native uh, Mexican groups, uh, various types of uh, Indian groups that live there. Now this map, this is what all the, all the land that Mexico had when it gained its independence in 1821. And on here, it, it kind of updates everything that we're, we're going to talk about. What you see down below here is Mexico today. And you can see the Mexican secession of 1848, the independent Republic of Texas, and the Gadsden Purchase. And now, now I want to look at Texas. This is what Texas looked like originally. And you can see that the, uh, the rest of it is dotted and outlined. That's what it looks like today. So. And, this, and the, uh, the dates are, are when 
either Texas became independent or, and I'm going to say this, we purchased the land from Mexico, even though most of it was won in a war, but we paid them for it. Uh, let, me, let me see here. I've got, I don't remember. Oh, in 1821, Mexico was 1.7 million square miles. 1848, the U.S. takes over 950,000 square miles after the war on Mexico. And we paid $18 million for it. Uh, they seceded it after this, uh, the war in 1848 under the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Okay. And uh, that was kind of contentious for many, many years afterward, that, that treaty. The Gadsden Purchase, this little piece of land right here, that's a little over 9,000 square miles. We, we bought that, not through a war, but bought that. Um, in 1853, when Mexico was really broke and owed European banks millions of dollars. And we paid $10 million for that. So it was much more expensive to buy that little piece of land than it was to get all the rest. Now the little piece of land becomes important later on because what, what basically runs, anybody know what basically runs right across this part of the country? Mason Dixon line. Mason Dixon line, yes. Uh, well, the division between the south and the north. And where is that land? It's in the south. Just like Texas and all these other states. And this has implications later on with the Missouri Compromise, which allowed if the south was going to create a state, the north was going to create a state out of the territories to the west. The Constitution, as I said, it was based on the American Constitution. Everyone was free, including the Native Indians. Everyone was entitled to land. There was going to be land distributions, some of the large land, but the lands that the church had were divided up. Uh, all kinds of things. Just It was pretty much run the same way as the American Constitution, but it really didn't work well for them because of other, other things going on. The, the rich, the poor, and even the, still the church uh, were all trying to do their thing and a lot of groups, you know, military groups, all wanted to be in control. Even though it was a democracy. And this is a, a repeating scenario through the next hundred years for Mexico is that Somebody's always fighting for control. And we're not just talking about a political fight down in, in you know, uh, Cleveland or, or someplace like that within a party or, you know, that kind of fight we, we talk about now. They were bloody events. I got, I got to get over here. I'm just, you have to chain me to this thing. Americans in Texas. All right. After, after the... Mexicans won their independence and they had that large chunk of land to the north that was bordered the Louisiana Purchase and southern states were looking to expand westward and there were only about six or seven thousand Mexicans living in that area of Texas what we what I showed you on the map well the Mexican government actually wanted to settle it and so they encouraged Americans to move into Texas. They were given free land, and they could bring slaves. Now, what's interesting, and I didn't mention this well under the Constitution part, that the slave, slavery was outlawed in Mexico. But the Mexican government turned a blind eye to it because we, they had somebody that wanted to come in and settle and developed the land. So that all these people moved in, 30,000 of them by 1835, over 30,000 of them. 
And they were given large tracts of land. They had slaves to work the land. They didn't have to pay taxes for 10 years. But the, one of the things that really irritated the, the, uh, the t Americans that moved in there was that they were supposed to co convert to the Catholic Church. And there weren't very many Catholics in the South. So that really was a uh, contentious point for them. About 1834-35, the Mexican government said, you know, enough of this, we're broke, we need money, so you're going to have to pay taxes, and you can't have slaves anymore. So now the, Mex or the Texans are really upset, and we get a little problem. The 18, in 1836, the Alamo. Well, I'm not going to go into the history of that. I'm sure we all know about it. Um, and that's when Texas actually won its independence shortly after the Battle of the Alamo, a few months later. Uh, one, of the guys, one of the guys that's a savior and the most hated man in Mexico, four times, um, went there. He was the president of Mexico in 1836. He went there to the Alamo, of course defeated the Americans, or I should say the Texans. And then was later captured himself in a battle in Texas, and but was released under the agreement that Texas would become a separate and independent country, and which it did. But he, uh, Santa Ana, was basically the guy that kept saving Mexico from itself. He'd do so, he'd take care of all these problems, and then people get tired of him, or he wanted to become a dictator, so they kicked him out. A couple of years later, they were re-elected. So, okay, it's not the war with Mexico; it's the war on Mexico. We did; they didn't start it with us. We did it to them. And the thing, the war was caused by the U.S. encouraging those living in Texas, the Republic of Texas, to become a state. And the Texans thought that was a good idea, too. However, Mexico <coughs> believed that if Texas became a state, it would be the greatest act of aggression ever in Mexico. And, well, they went to war. Uh, General uh, Polk sent 30-some thousand troops under Zachary Taylor to, to Texas. And for the next, basically, two years, there was a, a war going on, and the U.S. troops were all the way down in New Mexico City, Veracruz, California area, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. We had several armies, and they were all won almost every battle. As a matter of fact, I don't believe the, the Mexican army won a single battle. But most of the land, most of the battles were very quick, and. All the, all the western states were, were conquered very quickly because Mexico had very few troops there. And a bunch of uh, guys that served down there, uh, General uh, Lieutenant Meade, Captain Lee, Captain Grant, all became famous generals in the Civil War. Okay. So they got a lot of, a lot of training down there. The Gaston Purchase, I, I already talked about that. The reason they wanted to, the U.S. wanted to buy the, the, the land called the Gaston Purchase is that they wanted to build a railroad that didn't go through the mountains. And the south, southern part of New Mexico and Arizona was the perfect place to do that because they could slip between mountain ranges down there. Um, although, Mexico didn't really like the idea. They did sell because they needed the money. They were broke, and they were concerned that foreign interest, i.e. the banking countries of Europe, which had loaned them millions and millions of dollars, would invade if they didn't pay some of that back. They had been paying back for a long time because they didn't have anything. Also, about this time, they get in trouble. The French invade. Mexico, and they needed arms and ammunition. So they, you now Mexico was always between the rock and the hard spot. 
All right. So, what this this map here? This now this is a very current map, and the the lighter line here is about as 100 kilometers or 65 miles wide on both sides of the, the border. And it shows all the states and in both the U.S. and Mexico. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this place right here, Naco and Columbus. And this, this border after the Gadsden Purchase, it has not changed. It's been the same. Uh, and there was another option before the Gadsden Purchase was still that land, a little bit more farther south, and the Baja Peninsula of California. But they, the Mexicans didn't take that. They took the, the smaller deal. Border problems, 1845 to 1917. Okay, we talked about the annexation of the Republic of Texas. Became another slave state. Okay. In the 1850s, 1880s. Indians, bandits, and Americans, uh, they, they love to commit crimes against each other, within each group. They would attack each other all the time. Not so much, and when I, I want to clarify, clarify something. When I say Americans, when I'm talking, it's Anglo-Americans. It's not Mexican-Americans. It's white Americans, Anglo-Americans. Okay. The Indians always were raiding somebody for food, you know, silver, gold, whatever, some, whatever they could carry away that they could use later, weapons. Bandits would rob trains, raid cities. And the Americans, well, they did the same thing to them. They did the same things to those groups, including Mexican Americans. They would try to push them off their lands, the ones that lived north of the border. And uh, I have a little thing here, just a second. Colonel Robert E. Lee, of course, this is just a year before the Civil War starts. He's a brevetive colonel on the border. Uh, and his feelings were that Indians, Mexicans, and Americans would commit crimes when it could be done with impunity. So if they figured they could get away with doing something to somebody, they'd do it. And there was a lot of killing going on. Not a pleasant place to be. The Wild West, it was wild, and it was extremely dangerous for most people. And I think the more that you had, the more dangerous it became for you. Because somebody else would want to take it. American industrialists and investment. Oh, by 1880, U.S. interests owned 85% of all the mining in Mexico. And we're talking gold, silver, and other, you know, copper, anything that could be mined and sold. The U.S., some industry in the U.S. owned it, 85%. There were hundreds of American engineers and their families living in Mexico, running those operations. Banks and invested heavily in these companies. And the Mexican government got just a pittance of what they were making. What, what other mineral or that we use a lot today is coming of use right now? 18, or 1990, 1900, I should say. 
Huh? Oil. 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 Yeah. And Mexico actually has is one a huge oil producer in the Caribbean. And they produce a lot of oil. And American industry moved right in, wanted to move right in on that. And they did. Rebellion in the plan of San Diego. Uh, Carranza, Villa, and Zapata. All right, these are, these are some pretty major players. 1910, the president of Mexico, let's say Madero, decided to run again, and he, but he had told people he would. Well, people didn't like that because the Constitution says you can only run for so many years. And they didn't always follow the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he ends up being killed. And there's a fight now to who's going to run the country. And you, these are three of the major players right here. And at one time, Villa, Pancho Villa, was a general under Carranza, right up until about 1915. They're fighting. Villa and Zapata actually controlled all the north and the south. Carranza only enjoyed a little bit of the central area of Mexico. Now, you would have thought that they might have come to a an agreement, but they don't because they both, all three have different ideas of what they wanted to do, how they wanted to change the Constitution, and divide up the land, the industry, you know, whatever they could get their hands on. They were always trying to gain something uh, from an, one other. There was a cartoon I saw, one for all and all for none. <laughs> and it showed these three guys as uh, cartoon characters. And that's the way it was. Uh, well, neither one of them, none of them, became the president. Via uh, well, the U.S. actually endorsed Carranza because he had the best politics and the best, what appeared to be a better plan for Mexico than either uh, Via or Zapata. So they left, they gave him money and other support, uh, weapons and stuff for his army. Well, that really took Villa off. Villa breaks away from Carranza. Zapata is also ticked off. And you know, we're gonna leave Zapata because he's way in the south. But Carranza and Villa, Carranza's still in the central, but Villa is up north right along that border. And he is really steamed about the whole thing. He says, I'm not going to get anything. They're supporting Carranza. Carranza is going to put his, his army on me. The U.S. is supporting him, so they're not going to help me. And he was right. So what does he do? He starts raiding across the border to the north to get supplies, weapons, ammunition, and anything else. Killing people, innocent people, in many cases. Um, and then they, they come across the raid, raid, you know, into a city, uh, one of them, Columbus, uh, New Mexico, and I'll we'll talk about that in just a minute. And then they would run, then they would hightail it back across. Well, the U.S. policy at the time was, we're not going across the border. So they had all these little forts along the, or posts all the way along that border. Well, you know, if you just sit behind the gate at that post, you're not doing anything. You're not going to catch anybody because you never know when they're going to come. And then by the time you get your troops out to wherever they need to be, the, the rebels have gone back south and we don't go across the border. Well, that's, that's going to change by 1916. The U.S. is going to authorize U.S. Army troops to cross into Mexico to chase the bandits. Okay. 
mostly Thea. And there's a lot of other little guys, you know, they all have their, there's a lot of other little groups here. It's just not Thea's uh, uh, army, it's a lot of other little groups that are doing the same thing. You know, the troublesome critter. Now, we have Mexico and a porcupine. The porcupine, actually, its quills are actually bayonets from rifles. And the porcupine represents all the little fractions or factions in Mexico that are bandits and troublemakers. And you can see that he's having a hard time pulling those out. And that was in the final paper in 1913. Oh. And we have Uncle Sam sitting on the fence, or standing on the other side of the fence there. So, yeah, watching what's going on. And the U.S. is not happy because the Mexican government really isn't doing anything to these guys. They're, they're, they're doing whatever they want, when they want. All right, 1915, 1917. Blackjack Pershing, he's a Brigadier General, he was promoted over 800 senior officers to Brigadier General. So they, they thought he had something going for him. Uh, he, he goes, he's sent to the border under, and to work under the command of General Funston, and Pershing is actually the guy that's getting it all done along the border, but he's not happy because he still can't go across the border after these guys. And then they allow that to happen. And I'm not sure how many raids that they made, but they went as far as 400 miles into Mexico chasing the, uh, never caught them. He'd disappear into the mountains. You know, they're, they're the, the, these Mexican bandit armies would just break up and scatter and meet someplace else. They all knew where to go. And the U.S. units were stayed pretty much in their columns, in their trains, and when I say trains, I'm talking about it's like a wagon train, not not the steam locomotive. So they 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 were never able to catch them. And in 1916, President Wilson calls for the National Guard. This is the second call up for the National Guard. First one was Spanish-American War. This is the, the second call up. They call every state that has a National Guard and said, your men are going. By the end of August in 1916, there are 100, over 111,000 National Guardsmen along the border. That 111,000 is the equivalent of the standing army at the time. But our army is spread out. We've got thousands in the Philippines. We've got them all across the western states. Because we still have trouble with Indians in the western states by 1916. There's still some problems. And they're at forts on the east coast, you name it, uh, in countries in central and south, or not South America, but the Caribbean. So we have a lot of, a lot of our troops are all over. Plus, there's about 35,000 regular U.S. Army troops on the border. So we're looking at, in the neighborhood of 145 to 150,000 troops along the border. We don't put our Army troops out. Well, we do have some. But can you imagine if we put 150,000 U.S. Army troops on the border today? That would, if they were Army troops, that'd be about one-third of the army. All right. All right. I mentioned Naco, Arizona, or in just a half mile away is Naco, Mexico. This is a post. It was originally uh, built in 1913, and it was just tents. And then they had some some wooden buildings, but. By 1919, of course, this is after after World War One starts. This 
post is because they really make it nice. It's Adobe. It's the only one along the border out of 30, 35, 36 military posts built in this little time frame of 1915 to 1916-17 that is built of Adobe. All the rest were wood or tents. Uh, the, this here is a, a barracks here, another set of barracks here. These are the NCO quarters, that's where all the sergeants live. And the, the four houses right down here, those are officer quarters. And there's a, wa there's a water tower over here someplace, you can't see it. Uh, currently it's fenced in, the chain link fence. Uh, somebody tried to burn it down. And uh, these, the buildings right over here were heavily damaged in a fire. These are all boarded up. Uh, you can't go, wait, there's a historical project to try to refurbish this. Uh, and you can actually get in there, but you have to have, you know, go with somebody from the histor that historical group to get in there. Uh, there's also some, uh, some other little outbuildings back here, and I'm, I'm not, I think this might be like the cookhouse right here. And a little farther back, probably the latrines and the shower pumps. That I'm not quite sure of. And you can see right over in the top corner over there, those are regular houses now, as well as right here. Now, another cute little story. We uh, we go down, we're just down there in April. And it's only four tenths of a mile from here to the border. So that's not very far, less than a half mile. And on the east side of town is a quite a large complex for the Border Patrol. And they have green and white vehicles, you know, SUVs. They're all over the place. And I thought they were all in the parking lot. I think they just, as one pulls out of the parking lot, another one pulls in. Because they were just all over the highways and every other place you looked. So, now, we're standing at the chain link fence here. We're, we take a few pictures, you know, and stuff like that. You can't see much. And we get back in the car and we drive right over here. And as we come around the curve here, we see a Border Patrol vehicle parked on the corner. So oh, he's watching. Of course, he's facing south. And uh, we just we just park over here in the actually right about where this car is right here. And I'm out there taking some pictures, and all of a sudden I hear this voice behind me. Says, you interested in what's in there? And I thought for sure it was going to be the Border Patrol guy uh, because this used to be a little place where uh, um, illegals would slip through and hide and then move north. And I turn around, it's a guy coming out of, out of his house here. And uh, he starts talking about the place. I told him what we were doing down there. And he said, oh, you want to go inside? I got a key. <laughs> and I said, I said, really? And he says, but you're not going to see any more from the inside than you see from the outside because everything is boarded up. And we talked a little bit longer again. Really nice guy, very knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the whole history of, of Camp Naco. Uh, so, but this is what a, a, a camp, what a military post looked like uh, in 1916 along the border. And I'm not sure how many men were stationed there, but it was probably each one of those buildings probably had a company. Probably 800 to 1,000 men. All right. The newspapers, now, this is a little bit early. This is 1912, but these were in the paper all the time. Yeah. Danger of attack, 100 unarmed Americans in jeopardy of their lives in Mexico. We talked about Villa and miners. Villa's troops took a train that was going, had a bunch of mining engineers on it. They took all the Americans off and they executed them. So, and I think, it, does it say how many? Oh, no, they just executed this one guy. I'm sorry, there, there was another article. This Thomas Fountain, an American. And they gave him the right to flight. The right to flight means you get to run. Now we're going to shoot you. So he was he was 
basically executed. Uh, but those are things that, that the bandits, the, the rebels would do to people, and not just Americans, but they would do it to other Mexicans. They realized that if you were in another group or that they disliked or you were rich or something like that, you, had a, you could have a serious problem. The others, they butchered 200 Spaniards. This actually happens in Mexico itself, uh, where they turn on each other. So nobody is safe, and that was 1913. Company E to the border. Company, e, this is not actually 1914, two years before they actually went. They were all called up. The National Guard units were called up, but they didn't go. And you might you might recognize uh, some of the names on here. Adolf Trier is the commander of the National Guard, the Company E in Pine Lake, in 19, uh, 1914. A few others, and actually, my grandfather, right here, Herman Barr. He was a private. By then, he had uh, four years in the National Guard. Look at that, 80, 80 men on the roster. <laughs> That's not a big, those are the size of a companies many years ago, 80 men. 250 today. All right, the front page, Company E going to the front. This is 1916. Look at every, every article. It's about going to, the, going to fight Mexico. So, there was plenty to read. They were called up and the date is, is it June? June 19th? No, they were in Mexico in less than a month or on the border, they didn't go to Mexico, they went to the border. Another, another headline, Tears and Joy. You know, thousands of people showed, out, showed up. They would marched from 2nd Street where the, the uh, armory was, where basically right next to St. Peter's Place there, that, that, blank, that empty spot, that was where the old armory was. When they marched from there, they would go and I'm not sure which train they took, but let's just say they went over to Western Ave down Western Avenue or Forest Avenue to the train station over there where the old depot still is. They get on the train. They march this. So that, that whole that whole route would have been jammed with people. Nobody went to work. The business is all closed. Of course you have the the uh, the mothers, the wives, and the sweethearts all, you know, crying and, well, they're, they're going to go away and we aren't going to see them again, obviously, uh, which is pretty standard. So they, uh, they were on their way. They were only at Camp Douglas for about two weeks when they took the federal oath, um, become part of the regular army. You know, it was really interesting. I was reading another article about that each company in the regiment stood in their position and as they went down the line, each company, every man would raise their hand and take the oath. They did each company one at a time. And it was reported in this article that there were a few guys in a couple of the companies from way up north in Wisconsin that didn't raise their hand. Well, they were immediately removed from the from the formation, taken back to the very stripped of their uniform, all military equipment, put on a pair of civilian clothes and marched back down in front of the regiment where they received a lot of fond farewell in the words. No, not, you know, here they are, they didn't want to go. I ran into that problem in the in nineteen 90 when uh, the uh, 
the Iraqi war, or not the Iraqi, but the Gulf War started. We were inspecting a unit in uh, Arkansas, and there was a bunch of senior NCOs that said, this isn't what I signed up for. And I thought, well, what the hell did you sign up for? And they wouldn't let them out. They weren't letting anybody out, so those guys were going. Good for them. All right, Mexican World War Call poster. And I, I uh, this is really nice. And uh, a couple here in town let me copy this uh, on Dick and Judy Rupp. I don't know if any of you know them, but they were they were kind enough. They have the, the original up in their house, and uh, I was they, they let me borrow it, and I, I had it scanned in, and that's really nice. And my copy is like right over there. So uh, this is really nice. These are all the guys that went left on uh, in, in June and then went to Camp Douglas, uh, Wisconsin, where they stayed for a couple of weeks. They went through physicals, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. All the stuff, how many of you guys been in the service? Well, right, good number, thank you. They, uh, some of them didn't make it. Poor eyesight, bad feet, overweight, too old. They just couldn't keep up. So about 10 of the final line company were sent back and mustered out of the service. And they probably, they, there were plenty of volunteers so they were able to fill those slots again. But on this roster, there is 149 men, not counting the two up here because this is the regimental commander and, and another guy. We're not counting them. But there's 149 from Fond du Lac Company E 15 of which died in World War One. Alright, so they're down, they were actually, company U was actually down in, in, uh, in Texas near Fort Sam Houston. They never went to the border. No National Guard units crossed the border. They were, even though they were federalized, they didn't want the National Guard guys going across the border. They only wanted the regular Army guys to go. So the National Guard guys were the ones that manned all the post, a lot of the posts, provided additional security. But when Company E got to San Antonio, there were already 60,000 troops at Fort Sam Houston. So that's quite, a, that's quite a chunk. And they were from all over the country. And the uh, commanding general down there said, it was nice to see the Wisconsin boys show up because the Illinois boys showed up just before that. They were still in civilian clothes. Wisconsin had all of its war gear. They were in their uniforms, had all their equipment, and Illinois guys, half of them didn't have anything. So, General was not pleased. You can imagine, hey, we're already going to war. You know, how come I don't have my uniform and my weapon? All right, uh, so they're down there, and they do a lot of different stuff. You know, they're out training, they're practicing all their tactics, setting up a skirmish line for that. That's just a line of guys laying down to fire their weapons at the enemy. Uh, practicing with machine guns, you name it, they were doing it. And marching. I think the final guys thought they had marched to the moon and back because they did some really long marches over short periods of time. And there actually, there's an article that lists all the marches that they did. I'll, I'll have it up on the screen in a minute. And how many miles to each place that they went and back. So they, they did a lot, of, a lot of soldiering, infantry. That's what the infantry did, walk. And uh, now they ride in helicopters, armored personnel carriers. Well, So, and they, they have all kinds of things going on. They're playing baseball, basketball, they're football. Matter of fact, uh, second regiment won the division championship in football while they were down there. And they played teams from other states and everything else too. So, I mean, it wasn't just all marching and, and shooting weapons. They, they had other recreational facilities. Uh, YMCA was very prominent in, in these camps. Um, they had record players and records for the guys to listen to, tables with pen and paper so they could write home 
You know, that's what the YMCA did. Now think, our time in the service, it was the USL. They just, the USL just took over later on of what the YMCA used to do uh, in the war. And the YMCA was also, this is also great practice for them to when they went to uh, Europe for World War I. YMCA was heavily involved with the troops there also. So the boys are getting ready to come home. Oh, the, uh, big Thanksgiving Day meal. It's all in the paper, what they had, you know, just all kinds of great stuff. Christmas meal, the same thing. The boys are getting ready to come home. They've got their muster orders to entrain in San Antonio to head for Wisconsin. And as they got on the train, they were told to get the back off, get themselves off the train. They weren't leaving yet. And uh, of course, they had there were a lot there was lots of that stuff going on. But within a few days, they were they were back on the train and they were headed home. They weren't coming directly to Wisconsin. They were going to Fort Sheridan, Illinois, where they were going to be paid, mustered, uh, given a physical, turn in all their federal equipment, and mustered out of active federal service and back into the Wisconsin National Guard. So, now, this, you, you can read some of these things, you know, uh, different things that maneuvers, football, there's 2nd Wisconsin 41, Engineer 0. You know, um, first regiment wins football championship, a practice march. Regiment wins uh, second division football title. You know, all this marching. Here. Now, this is August in Texas. Anybody ever been down south in Texas in August? When they say it's 110 in the shade, they're not lying. When I was stationed at Fort Hood, it was pretty miserable at times. They marched 15 miles one day. Fond of that company E was very, very fortunate. They had very few people get sick, men didn't fall out, and nobody died. Some units could not say that. There were some units where a lot of guys fell out. Some men died, various diseases, pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia was probably the most prevalent thing that happened to them. But in a year, in a year and a half, other things were going to be happening to these guys, and a lot more of them died. All kinds of medical issues uh, in, a, in a real war. These guys were sleeping in nice tents. They aired them out every day. So, but they did a lot of marching. Did they march to carry equipment? Oh, well, marching is, it builds up your endurance. So, so they would carry their, their rifle, their backpack, which had supplies, canteen, water, and ammo. It's, well, yeah, it's, if you want to, yeah, it's a good exercise. I mean, yeah, and they're walking in boots, and it's hot, and there's no shade. So, yeah, yeah they, but they would have it like the, a train, and I would say a train again, it gets, it's, it's, it's wagons or vehicles that would haul, you know, like your, uh, your food, stuff like that. No, they would have a half a canvas piece for tents. They didn't just bring those big tents and set them up every night. They, they brought a little, uh, the, old, the old pup tents, I'm sorry. Uh, you get your shelter half and then you hook it up with somebody else and the two of you sleep in that thing. And they would have a blanket or two. And whatever personal uh, gear, you know, uh, a towel, washcloth, soap, stuff like that. But they weren't carrying a lot of other stuff. There's, there's no room for that. A big picture of your wife or your girlfriend in your pocket, and that's about it. Universal, oh, uh, the home front, oh, the Red Cross schools and Universal Military Training Group. The Red Cross, oh, that was that was the group. They did stuff just like the YMCA. American Red Cross. We're gonna go back right to the beginning of World War One in Europe. American Red Cross sent. 100 and 
think it's 20 nurses to Europe on what they call the Mercy Ship in September of 1914, along with a bunch of doctors. They were divided up once they got to Europe into smaller groups, and they were doled out to all the fighting countries, all the belligerents, <coughs> Germany, Austria, Italy, France, Belgium, Great Britain, you name it. They all got hospital, uh, Red Cross units. Didn't matter what side you were on. We weren't in the war. Okay. So, and they were over there, most of them were over there for about a year. Uh, anywhere from six months to a year. Local nurse, Genevieve Dyer, and I think I mentioned her earlier, or we saw her in that, that other slide. Um, she's from Fond du Lac, and she's a nurse. She got her degree in Chicago, and she comes back after being in Vienna, Austria for almost a year, and is heavily engaged in developing local Red Cross organizations in Fond du Lac County. Her and uh, another gal are out there, and they go to all the little, to all of the little places like Brandon, Ripon, Waupon, you name it. That's where they would go and set up Red Cross um, committees in those villages or, or towns. Nineteen nineteen sixteen. Well, guess what? We don't have Red Cross Fond Lac anymore. We got rid of it last year. The office is closed. And I'm not sure what exactly when last year or was at the beginning of this year, but I think it was just they were just there ninety nine years. Just short. But they got their they got their chapter. Uh, Henry Boyle. Dean Bell from the Episcopal St. Paul's Episcopal Church. All these other people, you know. And Genevieve Dyer. Genevieve would later fight and not fight but serve in World War I as a lieutenant in the nursing corps and was the first female member of the Bonnet American Legion. All right, so we had all these nurse, nursing things. And they could also go to Chicago to get more training on how to establish things and get things done. So a huge push. And look at this is 1916, early 1917. We're not in the war yet. But everything those nurses learned in Europe, they're now putting into effect in the US. They are being prepared and preparing the US for the war. They know where to go. Schools, ah, there's actually a movement to teach military training in the high school here in Fond du Lac and other schools. I have not found anything else after this is mentioned, but it's not just in the high schools, the colleges also. There's another article, and I was unable to find it, uh, that, and I have read it, that uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison wanted to introduced military training, compulsory military training for all the men that were like juniors and seniors. All right, now, there's always pros and cons of universal training for military. Uh, C.D. Smith, he was a lawyer in Fond du Lac, and uh, her, her last name is Cone. I can't remember her first name. Uh, she's for it. She believes that if we train early and train well, we'll be prepared and nobody's going to want to touch us. Oh, that's usually a pretty good uh, argument that if you train and you're prepared and somebody knows that, they're not going to want to make war with you because they know it'll be a, a tough deal. You want to make war with people that aren't trained. It, C.D. Smith, not nah, quite that way. Smith believes that Germany has doesn't care about us and that we can raise an army in a matter of weeks and fight anybody that invades. And in this last, I don't have, here it is. 
If that is kept in mind, we shall need no standing army to keep others from encompassing us. Really? Why would you not want to take over a country that has no army? I mean, it's like free picking. So I don't think I don't think his argument was very good. Okay, America and the European War neutral? No way. The U.S. was not neutral. It sold raw materials, military supplies, medical supplies, loan money, and we loaned Great Britain a lot of money. Germany, not so much, but we loaned, we did everything for each side. So, well, in that case, I guess we could say we were neutral, but we were involved. We just helped both sides, but Great Britain got the bulk of it. The Zimmerman Telegram. Uh, anybody remember that from school? Uh, Arthur Zimmerman that was the foreign minister of, or foreign affairs minister for Germany at, the, at this time. And now we've had all this problem with Mexico on the border. Mexico wants its land back. It wants this, it wants that. And we're not having good relations. And he says, you know what? The U.S. has got, it, got has its hand full on the border. So he sends this Zimmerman, what's referred to as the Zimmerman telegram, to the German ambassador in Mexico City. And it says, in just so many words, that tell the Mexicans, if they join us, we will give them money, arms, equipment, and when we kick everybody's butt in the war, and you fight the Americans, and we kick their butt, you can have all that land back. You just name how much you want of it. Well, the Brits intercept this message, decode it, and give it to the U.S. Well, Wilson gets this, and it's published just a couple days after Wilson sees it. So it's all in the paper, and Americans are outraged. Wilson calls, calls the German ambassador Bernstorf, Stor, Bernstorf into his office and tells him to pack his bags, here's your passport, have a nice trip back. You're no longer welcome in the United States or your delegation. So the Germans are gone. Diplomatic relations are broken off. A little, just a little bit later. But one of the items that precipitated that is the Zimmerman letter. Now, oh, that's that. That's Wilson's plan for universal training. Okay, and he does that. He wants to train 500,000 men a year for 11 months at a time. And then you still are obligated for two years to, actually until you're 25 you're obligated, but for the next two years you have to go to, go to camp for two weeks at a time. And if you're, if you got a broken leg and you're not, or you're otherwise able to serve, well, they'll defer you, but guess what? You're not out of the mix, you're gonna go the next time. So only, only people that could not physically do it, uh, you know, guys with, Deformed backs, flat feet, etc. They weren't uh, able to. They would not be selected under this program. All right. Okay. This comes out in May of 19. I don't want that. Here, here's what I want. Germany aiding Mexican bandits. This goes back to the uh, Zimmerman telegram. German agents were already in Mexico. They were giving money and supplies and whatnot to Mexican rebels, aiding keeping keeping the border thing going. So that would keep the U.S. from sending troops to Europe or want to get involved. Uh, there were a number of Germans that were actually shot by Mexicans down there. So they had a, a quite a quite a thing going on. With, uh, with Germans in Mexico, and they were all in northern Mexico, keeping an eye on U.S. operations. Now, the, the Zimmerman telegram also included Japan. Okay, it mentioned Japan. It mentions Japan, and they they say, you know, if this happens, Japan can have all the western those all those island. Areas that we have out 
in the Pacific, Mexico is going to get all the that 900,000 square miles back. But both countries deny knowing anything about it. And that may be true. It may, he may never have passed that along, and the Japanese may never have seen it either. Uh, we're not sure. I don't think anybody's really sure anymore. But uh, they all deny it, ever seen it. Here's the here's what it looked like. All here's the coded message, and then the decoded message on the on the right. Now, the real question, and, and for a long time it was, they wondered if it was just a British plan to get us involved against the Germans. Yeah, pretty good idea. <laughs> but later on, they the Germans actually admitted to uh, sending them the telegram. And it was sent across a telephone cable. Now, the telephone cable goes from Germany to the US. And here the, the Brits are on the line answering the call. So they get it, they were able to break the code and embarrass Germany. Uh, and Carranza, again here, they're saying we don't know. Uh, this is not. They don't. They don't want to get involved in a world war. So they're they're denying everything. Oh, no, that went too far. Unrestricted submarine warfare. That mean, and Germany was doing it for a long period of time, as well as Great Britain. They were doing it against each other. Great Britain was sinking everything headed for Germany to, to starve them out, and the Germans were doing the same thing to keep supplies, you know, wheat and whatnot coming from Canada and the U.S. to Great Britain, and sinking the ships so that they could starve Great Britain out. Well, they stopped for a while because everybody got really upset that they were sinking uh, uh, and killing a lot of innocent people, which was really true. You know, people, people on like the Lusitania and other uh, uh, liners. So, and first of February, 1917, Germany reissues its unrestricted warfare um, statement, and it says it will sink any and all ships that enter. British territorial waters or French waters, anything that would support the Allies, it will be sunk. We don't care if it's a, a liner, a fishing boat, a tanker, whatever. We don't care what flag it's flying, it will be sunk. <coughs> well, this certainly is, upsets a lot of Americans. And at this, and at this point, U.S. Merchant Marine uh, vessels are now armed. They have uh, naval armament on them and they will shoot at a German submarine if possible. All right. And a, two weeks before the U.S. gets into the war, measures for defense, only U.S. action at present. The state of war now exists with Berlin. No need for a declaration. They've been sinking ships, killing Americans. All these things are in violation of international law. And Congress just says, let's just do it. But Wilson waits for a while. Then on 2nd of April 1917, Wilson asked Congress for a declaration of war. Four days later, Congress passes that declaration of war with one dissenting vote. A woman from Montana, or was it Wyoming? You now I can't remember her name. Rankin, wasn't it? Rankin, yeah, Rankin. I think she's from Wyoming too. Yeah, yeah. That's, I couldn't remember if it was Montana or Wyoming. Yeah, Rankin. Yeah, she was the only one that did not vote for war. 
And in July 1917, Fauna County is National Guard units, units because Company E splits. Becomes more than one. They got so many guys. They got another unit. They had they leave for Camp Douglas. Uh, every time they go, it's Camp Douglas. And in May of 1919, they return home. So that's the end. <laughs> Are there any questions? No questions. Yeah. So how many troops we had on the Mexican border? How many? How much? Uh... Border patrol do we have down there now? Approximate number. Oh, I would have no idea how many uh, border patrol people are down there. I mean, I kind of probably approach some, some near that number. Oh, uh, I would I wouldn't say we have a hundred and some thousand down there, but I, I'm sure there there's there's quite a few. When I was went by that border, border patrol station, and I saw all those vehicles in there. I said, Holy cow! You know, those are what what are in the parking lot. Who knows what's out there and about, and I don't know where any of those other ones might have been along the way, too. So, I don't know how many uh, people are down there. Yes, sir? Were there any actual fighting between the Americans and Mexicans? Oh, yeah, when, when uh, Pershing went into Mexico, there was, there was fighting. Uh, there were skirmishes along the border uh, at, at, oh, at Columbus, New Mexico. Villa's men raided across one night and killed Seven, 17 people, I believe it was, and then uh, and scooted back across the the, uh, the border, and they, they they burned most of the town and, and killed killed uh, civilians, and uh, I think there were seven U.S. soldiers killed there also, because they already had they had some soldiers stationed there. Uh, Columbus is only a few miles north of the border, so there were there were uh, uh, there was killings. Uh, there was a guy from Appleton that was killed, and he was in a regular army. And this is down by Brownsville, the Matamoros area. And they found him on the Mexican side of the, the border with his throat cut. And several, you know, marks on, on his head. So, yeah, there, were, there was killing going on. There, uh, regular soldiers were, were killed. Uh, U.S. soldiers were captured and then later released. Uh, Carranza released the, I think there were 21 soldiers that were captured in a battle. But yeah, there were, there were battles. Americans were killed. Uh, the total number, I, I couldn't give you a hint. It was, I don't think it was more than 100 over the years. Yes, sir? Was there a reporter assigned to Company E that... Yeah. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. This is interesting. Uh, George Clip, who was on, the, who was on that roster, uh, he actually... I think he belonged, worked for the Daily Commonwealth. And he was in the guard unit, and he's down there, and he's sending reports back almost daily. And then all of a sudden there's an article in the paper that he had to stop. The U.S. Army said, no, there are no reporters in the units. <laughs> he's not, he, he wasn't authorized to report on the operations of the unit, and that's what he was doing. And it was being... How did he send his information back? Letters. Letters. Yeah. Uh, you know, you could have sent something back on a, on a telegraph, but that would have been expensive. Mm -hmm. But a letter, it took, when they left here, it took them four days by train to get to San Antonio. So, uh, but letters were, were the what, means of communication. The guys wrote all the time. They, they, they did a lot of writing. You know, they, were, they weren't on the phone. That was, that was too expensive. Not a lot of people had phones here. So you didn't call your wife. Well, you know, every night and check in. But uh, letters were the way, and yeah, Clip was <laughs> he probably got his hand slapped by some general for, for doing it. But that's the way everybody was doing it, and then it was, uh, there was a stop to it. Yes? What, what's the uh, time frame on the picture with Pontrepo? Oh, 1913. That's 1913. That's at Fort Bliss, El Paso, Texas. At, well, what's Fort Bliss now, I'm going to say. Um, at El Paso, Texas, and there's one guy missing there, and he is General Obergon, who Via also served under. And, um, of course, Via split with him, too. But Obergon is there. Obergon, in 1920, becomes the president of Mexico for four years. Yeah. And almost every one of these guys, the Mexican guys that I mentioned, 
were assassinated at some point or executed. What was the relationship with Pancho Villa then? Oh, this is this is before all the problems. Yeah, so this is just before the problem started. So this is before the U.S. Uh, decided to support Carranza. Okay. So yeah, everybody was happy, you know, just to uh, see Persians got that big spot on yeah. his face. But you, but Villa was one of the uh, big shots at that time in Mexico. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. he was. Yeah, he'd be on the Interpol list today. You know, they'd want, they'd want, they'd be hunting him down. He, he was well, not quite like Bin Laden, but that's the, that's the kind of uh, view I would take of if we were looking for him today. It'd be, it'd be like that. So, uh, yes, sir. I was reading that one article on that one American that was executed. Mm -hmm. No, they said he was a machine gunner for Vila. And oh then yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was. I got. I got. He wasn't an engineer, but yeah, he's a machine gunner. Yeah, and then he must have been, was there fighting between factions in oh, Mexico yeah. too? Were they oh, yeah, it? yeah. All those, you know, if you were if you were working for Villa and Carranza guys came along, you know, we'll take you right out. Yeah, I'm sorry, that, that guy was the machine gunner. Yeah, there I were a number so. of Americans uh, working for the various Mexican uh, military yeah, units. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, other, yes, sir. Your presentation was excellent. Oh, well, thank you. This is a period in American history that most people, it, it's totally oblivious. To what yeah. The problem is, this still colors the relationship between U.S. military and Mexican military. And one thing anybody in the U.S. military better never do is show up in Mexico <laughs> unannounced because because yeah. this still is a very real situation for the Mexicans. Your U.S. military not welcome here. You're right. Yeah. Well, you know, across, well, first of all, it's against the against military rules across the border in your uniform unless you're on a military recognized military mission. If if I was still wearing mine, I was down in El Paso a couple of times, and I wanted to go across the road, across the street, no way, not in your uniform, can't do that. Uh, it's uh, it, th things haven't changed much in a hundred years. It's, yeah. We're still we're still having the problems for two basically two hundred years. Uh, that Mexico and they still have a tremendous amount of problems. But that whole time from the time they were gained their independence in 1821, really up until about 1940, it was just one revolution after another, one rebellion after another. Various frac factions fighting for control. They just—it was—it was amazing that, and every time somebody else took control, guess what? They just eliminated the opposition. They killed a lot of people. It was on—it wasn't unusual for them to take a whole, a whole unit out and just execute them. It was—that's the way it was. One of the other things that when 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 Pershing was on the on the border, that I didn't, I didn't mention. And I, I talk about, you know, they, they, they marched and rode. The, cav the cavalry rode into Mexico. The infantry walked. And yet they, and then they had their trains. They also used airplanes. Believe it or not, this was a training ground for the Army Signal Corps. The how to use planes as observation points. And report back. Now I said Army Signal Corps. That's what the who the planes belonged to before at the beginning. Anybody know who the and I'm not going to remember his name. His name that and he has ties to Fonlek was the colonel in charge of the Army Signal Corps planes. Married General Bragg's daughter. And I cannot remember his name, and I know there, but he married. Uh, he was. He was a lifelong, uh, you know, career military guy. He's, him and the, the, his wife were buried out at West Point. I cannot remember his name, though. but he married uh, Bragg's daughter. Retired just before World War One. You know. Other questions? Yes, sir. What year was that when they used those planes? Uh, 1916, just before World War One. We were, you know, the Army had bought planes, and. Uh, you know, here's a whole new thing, you know, for the military. Just what what can we do with these? You know, you have to be a real forward thinker to 
what, how, how can we do things with planes? How can we make them really useful? Because they're expensive. They're expensive to maintain. You know, the first Army guy killed in a plane was fine with, was it Orville or Wilbur Wright? And they crashed in what is now all of Arlington National Cemetery. His name is Selfridge, Lieutenant Selfridge, and he's got a huge monument a stone like spire uh, in Arlington. I mean, he was the first Army aviator or Army person to die. And they crashed right in Arlington. But he wasn't flying, he was just a passenger. So, Selfridge uh, Air Base in Michigan, north of uh, Detroit, is named for him. Uh, yes, sir? And then the Armistice Day was at 1918. 1918. I'm going to tell you about Armistice Day. And a lot of people think that their ancestors were actually World War I veterans, because Armistice Day does not mean the war is over. It just means we're not going to shoot at each other. The peace agreement wasn't signed until around the 28th of June of 1919. But, according to Congress, if you were not on active duty, before November 11th, or I should say November 11th and prior, you are not a World War I veteran. So if you went on active duty on the 12th of November, you're just a soldier in the Army. <laughs> War in the Navy, a sailor in the Navy. You are not considered, you are not considered as a World War I veteran. So, but yeah, that was signed, that was 19, uh, uh, 1911. And Pershing, uh, our, our man from the border, uh, there were a lot of people in Congress that wanted to court martial him over 19, uh, uh, November 11, 1918, because he continued to send troops forward to fight, gave them orders, gave the, to the Corps, Division, and, and that on down, orders to continue to fight, and any attacks that you had planned, you will execute them. Division commanders, many of them, refused to execute or saying they couldn't get their, uh, their field artillery support lined up so they wouldn't send them guys forward. But there were about 800 Americans killed on that last day for absolutely no reason. There's a guy from Fond du Lac. His name is Clifford, Royal Clifford Borick. He actually grew up in, uh, in Oldfield. He was up on the Meuse River. He was part of the Second Division, and they were attached to. No, he wasn't in the Second Division. Anyways, he was, his unit was attached to a Marine unit in the Second Division. I got to get that right. And they were going to. They were massing to cross the Meuse River on the night of the 11th, you know, late at night on the 10th. And the Germans realized they were in the woods, and they started. Shelling them. Well, Clifford gets a piece of shrapnel in his lower leg, and so he's out of the battle. They never, they never did attack. And in February 1919, he dies from septicemia from an infection of that wound. So technically, you want to say he was like the last guy from Bama to die in action. But there were other guys that died afterward too. There were, there were not quite a few. Others, others. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something.